Thank you all. Um, first, I wanted to uh, reflect back to Joe's presentation this morning and ask you all if there's something about which you've been wrong um, since working in this crazy world of tobacco harm reduction that you'd be willing to share with us. Something we've been wrong about? I think it'd be quicker to list the things I've been right about. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would be twofold. When I started in this August 2010 and immediately became an advocate upon quitting smoking, I thought that if I just called these local health departments, if you just call the American Cancer Society or the, the Wichita County Health Department and talk to the person who made the false claims about e-cigarettes, they would see the light. Well, I was wrong about that, but then you grow cynical and you think that nothing's ever going to change and that none of these people will ever reform themselves. And so then you saw the UK health groups really start to turn around and that has inspired some people here in America and other parts of the world, some of whom are here today, uh, to turn around their positions, including someone like Dr. David Abrams, who wrote the initial editorials uh, in New England Journal of Medicine saying e-cigarettes should just be banned as me uh, or only as medicines. And now he's a pro prominent proponent. So I was very proud to be wrong about that. I'm like Greg. I was totally wrong on the timing of this. I figured two years max, we'd be battling this out and everybody see that, yeah, they're quitting smoking and they haven't grown another head. Um, I, I think that what I was wrong about um, was kind of pre-vaping days. So I made the switch in 2009. I'm an early adopter. And when I started vaping, um, I too was an accidental quitter. I did not realize that smokeless tobacco was low risk. And um, so I was wrong about that before I became educated. But I guess I was surprised at how hard it was to get the information about the low risk nature of it. And the way we vapors started to learn about it was by researching nicotine, because there just wasn't much out there. So I was wrong about smokeless tobacco. I figured that out pretty quick. But it's still shocking to me how many people still think that it is as risky as smoking. Crazy. I have been wrong about many things. Um, I thought that we were going to lose the tobacco products directive uh, process and I thought it was going to be a medicine in Europe and I thought the tobacco and the pharmaceutical companies were going to own it within 18 months. I thought these little bottles of e-liquid are never going to take off. People want closed systems. It's all lots of rubbish. They'll be out of the market in five minutes. Um, I thought nobody wants any flavored products. Why would you want a flavored product when you can have one that tastes like tobacco and it tastes like what you're used to? Um, I, I could go on. There are many more things I've, I've been wrong about, but I think we will just say that unlike Unlike Greg and Julie, I have been pleasantly surprised by the outcome rather than unpleasantly surprised by how this has all turned out. Um, I would say that I've, I've only been in this field for about a year. I was wrong that it was going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was also wrong about uh, my, pre my assumptions of who is a valuable stakeholder and who's not. Um, I, who, who is not a valuable stakeholder? Nobody, everybody is, and that's what I was wrong about. Um, it's a slightly personal comment. I joined the industry 13 years ago, and I was started as a scientist, uh, putting together a team looking at how do we assess uh, current, which is then current combustible products, and then be able to compare the profile of the risk profile of those products versus future less risky products. And uh, I think we are all wrong in the sense that we are looking at reducing the harms from combustible tobacco by adding filtration technologies and a lot of other things. And we spent a good amount of time and money and effort to do that. And uh, I, mean, I would welcome you all to come to Southampton in, a, in our R&D where we have a sort of a live demonstration of what we did in the past and how we are doing things now. But the learning, or the wrong converted into a learning is that try what you may in the space of reducing harm from combustible in the combustible product it doesn't work from the experience we've had. But we gave our best shot at it. But what it did for us was fine tune and sharpen the tools for assessing products, which we are now using for assessing our non-combustible products. So I think uh, the wrong thing, which was kind of at least making sure that we have given it a good, good shot. 
uh, not working, publishing all that stuff, uh, has allowed us to land on the clarity that it has to be a non-combustible product delivered in nicotine. So uh, it's not all bad, but it's a good learning. It's an interesting question. Um, what have you been wrong about? I, I think, you know, as scientists, and that's all of us here, including the vapors, uh, science is about being wrong. It's about trying and asking, and, and it is about getting things wrong. You know, that's the only way we're going to find out what's going to be right. I think if I've done something wrong, I, I often beat myself up about, oh, you could have said that differently, or you shouldn't have had a go at them, or you shouldn't have been quite, you know, really mean about <laughs> the people in tobacco control. You know, who used to be my colleagues. Um, and, the, you know, the, the learning as well, looking at this lay epidemiology, how we're all actually part of the system. We're all impacting on each other. And... And what I've seen in this uh, this polarisation and this debate is, that, so I might get on media and then I'll have a little dig, you know, nasty little dig. I admit that, and I think that's wrong in re retrospect. I'm trying to be, you know, a bigger person. Um, and then, uh, and then you see the reaction, and so we have a very, you know, this polarised debate. Uh, if you go on and what you say triggers them to react and then they say something nasty and have a nasty dig or, or they shift from maybe not being so as anti as they actually were, but right, you're not going to have it now. I will dig my toes and I will work the rest of my career to make sure you don't get to vape in this country, you know? And so... I think it's really uh, what I've learned is to be a little bit more aware of how uh, we are impacting on, how we affect, or how we maybe trigger the opposition to to bite back, and then we bite back, and they bite back, and um, it, it's a learning experience. Totally don't know what is right, but um, I've I've seen some of the bite back, and I'm like, oh just need to be a little bit more careful and you know it's about trying to bring people along others at home are really good at that but it takes such a long time <laughs> you know so yeah just a learning experience and nothing's wrong as such I did a lot of wrong stuff before when I was in tobacco control <laughs> I'm trying to make up for it so um, one thing that we've heard consistently from the FDA is that there are pervasive misperceptions about nicotine in the U.S., and I know that that's similar across the world, even in the U.K., where you have public health authorities standing up and saying that these products are substantially less harmful than smoking. Uh, how do we correct these misperceptions, and whose responsibility is it? We... Those of us that were involved in demonising nicotine in tobacco control, we need to uh, own that and we need to say we were wrong and uh, that we deliberately did that. And so I've done that on national TV in New Zealand uh, on the 60-minute program. And um, I said, yeah, we, we did it deliberately. We, we thought that if we, we uh, demonise it and, you know, frame it as a mental illness, people won't like that. It was all part of the denormalisation stuff uh, to exaggerate the risks, to exaggerate the dangers. It was a deliberate strategy. I, re I was part of it. I remember that we, we knew. But then, you know, new generations come in and there's now, you know, a couple of new generations have come in through tobacco control and somewhere along the line they, don't, they didn't realise we made it up. And so now everyone sort of thinks it's like, you know, it's just written in the tablet. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not in science so much. And it comes back to that whole, what you were talking about. We need to, we actually have to go back and re-establish some facts. Uh, if I can add to the, the kind of statement I made earlier about misperceptions among, especially among healthcare professionals, uh, having, uh, as a trainer, as a medic, and knowing a lot of medical doctors in practice, uh, my experience is that they just want to see evidence from, usually from clinical trials, and I can already see people saying, no, this is not a clinical trial type stuff, it is more of a consumer-driven movement. Having said that, there is a role for 
even companies, if they're allowed to talk about uh, the, the effects of the products and the, the claims they can make based on substantiable science, for us to be able to do studies to demonstrate that yes, these products actually work and this is the, the long-term effect of using the products, and then being able to communicate these to, uh, to healthcare professionals, who at the end of the day are the ones who a smoker would go to and ask for some sort of either direct approval or a tacit approval or an endorsement. And that's an important component of that uh, education thing that's missing at the moment. Um, I would ask that people continue to engage. Um, as an example, three weeks ago, our street had a congressional trip out to the UK, and several people in this conference were able to take part of it in part and meet with our um, delegates. And it was about harm reduction at large, so it covered several several forms of harm reduction from several different perspectives. And um, I would just ask that people still continue to engage in uh, topics like that and educate when those opportunities arrive. Arise, sorry. <laughs> Speaking specifically to the United States, we heard the gentleman from Altria earlier in the main room where they felt that their responsibility, what they can do legally, is they can file an MRTP for their products, and that's great. But the true responsibility lies in those that have created and benefited from the misperceptions, which is the public health interest groups, and namely, uh, as well, the FDA. Uh, American Cancer Society, they can put out a nice policy position admitting that e-cigarettes are significantly less hazardous than smoking, but they don't give that policy statement to their obscenely ex expensive PR firm and tell them getting this on the local news in every uh, state is your top priority. No, they publish it and those of us in the room see it, but it doesn't make the news. But chiefly responsible and hopefully someone at FDA can pass this along, is Mitch Zeller at the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. Every conference that Mr. Zeller speaks at says the same thing over and over again. We need to correct these misperceptions. Uh, Michael Russell this, Michael Russell that. But nothing ever changes at FDA CTP. They have the time and money to create ads, to play on TV across the country with people cutting off their limbs to get cigarettes or children being transformed into robots because of e-cigarettes. But all this talk year after year about how we need to correct misperceptions and the FDA can't even bother to come up with one single campaign to correct misperceptions about nicotine. So it is the responsibility of FDA and God willing maybe under the Scott Gottlieb administration will actually see them do something rather than just come to closed conferences and admit that nicotine is not what kills smokers. The worst thing following Greg after that and he said pretty much what I would have said I, I think it is the responsibility of everybody um, and I feel bad for some people who are nominally in tobacco control and public health, who have had a change of heart and they're kind of moving in the right direction, but they're afraid to stand up because their livelihoods are in jeopardy. Um, they run the risk of being treated by pari as pariahs by their colleagues. Um, I have some sympathy, but I gotta tell you, lives are on the line. And consumers do not have the kind of credibility we do not have the voice, we do not have the money, we do not have the power that is necessary in order to change this conversation on our own. And this is very much, very much a human rights issue. And not to put too fine a point on it, but people are dying and people are suffering. And meanwhile, the information continues. And I had mentioned my misunderstanding about smokeless tobacco. Years ago, I was talking with somebody who is the former head of one of the body part organizations, and I'm not gonna name it, um, but I pointed out that his organization had been in large part responsible. I'm sorry, could you hear, can you hear me now? I, I told him he was in large part, his organization was in large part responsible for all of the misinformation about smokeless tobacco because I'm not a stupid person. And I believed it. And he said, well, you have to understand at the time we were afraid it was a gateway to smoking. 
there's a lot of people with blood on their hands and they need to get out there and do the right thing. Um, I think last year at this conference, there was a presentation which caused a little bit of a ruckus between Clive Bates and a female member of the audience who um, may or may not be here, where the advert for Blue was shown, um, which, for those of you who don't know it, pictures um, the torso of a young female in a bikini with the Blue logo on it. Um, the, there were a number of issues that people had with this advertisement, um, but um, the main ones seemed to be, oh, well, you know, it's, a, it's attractive in some way to children or young adults who are not smokers. Um, and I think the reality here is that that advertising would not exist if vaping companies were able to talk openly about the core value proposition of their product, which is this is not as bad as the thing you are presently doing. This is prohibited in Europe, and if, comf if you, know, you talk about it being the role of tobacco control, I would like to see vaping companies be able to do it, because they can do it way better than public health can. But their hands are tied and they can't do it, and as long as that remains the case, you will continue to see misperceptions about harm go the wrong way. And the reality is it needs a change, not just in the attitude, it needs a change in the law. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but is New Zealand the first country where all of these, the whole array of reduced risk products are available? And if that is the case, uh, will new legislation allow communication to consumers in such a way, or how would you envision that working? I think, uh, I think the USA has, has a wide range of products. Um, I guess, oh, Swedish Snus, do you have Swedish Snus? Yeah, but yeah. No so heat not burn. you have it's not heat, not burn? No, not ah, Okay. Freaking yeah, so we, so the um, heat sticks are now legal and Philip Morris are selling uh, its early days, so I think people can buy it online. Um, the a Brave Soul has uh, set up a website and started selling Swedish Snus, so we have. Uh, that's now uh, online, but in New Zealand, and and of course we have the uh, vaporizers. Um, the as I said, the current law is not fit for purpose. So, it, it the the ministry is now saying that nicotine liquid, because of that court case, is legal. Uh, but it's going to be covered by the existing act. So all of the regulation about tobacco, combustible tobacco products, they're now saying applies to nicotine e-liquid. Actually, they're not just saying nicotine e-liquid, they're saying vaping products. And the, a device was not covered by that law before anyway. So now ICOS, for instance, has to have standardised packaging and has to carry the health warnings which are all about smoking, and they're now saying that so so does the nicotine, the vaping products have to as well. It's, it's just ridiculous. Um, and Swedish Snus, the ministry came out and said, no, that's still banned. Um, so the, the, um, there's still, it's still a grey mess, and new regulation will sort that out. Uh, lobbying is, is happening pretty heavily in terms of what different groups want that new regulation to do. Tobacco control is seeing an opportunity to piggyback uh, more restrictive measures about combustible products onto the back of uh, changing the law to cover, you know, to have some regulations, to have some standards about vaping products. So, yeah, it, we're in a grey area. The Ministry's saying it's not as grey as it is. Um, I think that judge that made that decision would disagree. Mm. Thank you all very much. It's 3.30, so I will uh, comply with Jerry's wishes and wrap this up. Thank you, Rob. Thank you all.